Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. Acts chapter 20. I want to talk about leaving a godly legacy. Leaving a godly legacy. How many of you are here because someone in your family led you to the Lord? Raise a hand if that's you. Maybe a friend led you to the Lord. Raise your hand as well. Yeah, coworker. How about that? Raise your hand of a coworker. Okay, there's not as many. So raise a hand again. If, if a family member or a friend led you to the Lord, raise your hand, hold it up. In your family. Wow, see? Yeah, that human, that relational connection. Yeah, it's amazing. Don't we have them to also thank? Obviously, God first and foremost. But aren't you grateful for the influence of those in your life? We'll have to work on that. Okay. Um, <laughs> got an assignment for you today now. Yeah. Find that person or text that person and say thank you, you know, for, for leaving a legacy, for helping you know. And by the way, they don't have to necessarily have passed away yet. They've already begun building that legacy and helping you. Amen. Amen. Acts chapter 20. We learned last week that Paul preaching the gospel, disturbed the idol worship of Artemis. He escaped a, uh, a hostile environment and he's headed over to Macedonia and we're gonna be in verse two. Acts 20 verse two says, while there he encouraged the believers in all the towns he passed through. When he, or then he traveled down to Greece where he stayed for three months. Fun fact for you, this is where they believe he wrote the book of Romans. He was preparing to sail back to Syria when he discovered a plot by some Jews against his life, so he decided to return through Macedonia. Several men were traveling with him. They were Sopater, son of Pyrrhus, from Berea, Aristarchus and Secundus from Thessalonica, Gaius and Derb, Derby, Timothy and Tychicus, or Tychicus, and Trophimus from the province of Asia. They went on ahead and waited for us at Troas. After the Passover ended, we boarded a ship at Philippi in Macedonia and five days later joined them in Troas where we stayed a week. So we see that several men were traveling with Paul. They were most likely church leaders from the different towns that they had planted churches and the different churches in that region. They also were carrying with them most likely finances, funds to help bring to the church in Jerusalem. And they were traveling with Paul to head there. And we see here too the importance of two by two ministry where Jesus appointed the disciples to go out two by two, that these pastors went out two by two, these elders, they had help to support them to oversee things, as well as even overseeing finances. You need another set of eyes to help with that. All the logistics of leading a church they had support. And Paul is just moving through these places in a hurry to get to Jerusalem. He does not want to miss Pentecost. We go on to verse seven. It says this, on the first day of the week, we gathered with the local believers to share in the Lord's Supper. This is the clearest scripture we have where the church met on Sunday for worship and church. And so that's why traditionally today we worship as Christians, we worship on Sundays. It's the day where Jesus rose again. And so every Sunday they would celebrate this as Christians. And so they come together to have bread, break bread, literally to eat together, but also to have communion together like we did today. Paul was preaching to them. And since he was leaving the next day, he kept talking until midnight. How would you feel about if we stayed till midnight tonight? <laughs> the upstairs room where we met was lighted with many flickering lamps. Ooh, it was dark. You ever been in a room where like the candles are lit because you lost power and you see the shadows of everything? You could take a good nap, couldn't you? As Paul spoke on and on, a young man named Eutychus sitting on the windowsill, became very drowsy. Finally, he fell sound asleep and dropped three stories to his death below. 
Paul went down, bent over him and took him into his arms. Don't worry, he said, he's alive. Then they went all the way back upstairs, shared in the Lord's Supper and ate together. Paul continued talking to them until dawn and then he left. Meanwhile, the young man was taken home alive and well and everyone was greatly relieved. Whew. Careful up there in the balcony, don't get tired. Let me apply this point now before our youth fall asleep during my sermon. I'm just joking, I'm just joking. I look at this in a more positive manner. You can look at this and go and judge this young man and say, why are you falling asleep in church? I look at this differently. One, he was, Paul was preaching for a long time. He's getting ready to leave. He doesn't know if he'll be able to come back to this area again. So he's trying to download everything he can. I actually applaud the young man. And let me speak to you, young generation, young adults, youth, teens, kids in the room. This young man could have been anywhere, but instead he chose to be with the church to learn. And I applaud you for being here today. If you're watching online, and that's hard, that's hard to watch online too. I applaud you for sticking through it because it's not the same when you come into church. You don't feel the same environment all the time. And I just, I just applaud you for, for doing that. You know, obviously his endurance to listen for a long time was obviously not there. And so that would grow too as you, as you grow, grow older, as you get more mature, as you continue to be in long lectures, you'll be able to stay up. But there's also a point to where none of us can stay awake that long, right? You know, the, the environment, it was a warm room, the, all the lamps are lit, it's getting into the late night. And maybe, maybe the only suggestion I have is to not sit on a windowsill three stories up. <laughs> that would be the only wise thing, you know, just, just careful. That's the only caution I would have for you. But I just, I just want to apply this to you now because we need you, young generation. And I'm saying as if I'm in the older bracket. I am 40. I do, I am, I am definitely not a youth anymore. And I was a youth pastor for 11 years and I could say what I said then, I'll say it again. You are the church of today and tomorrow. We need you. Please continue to be hungry after God's word like Eutychus. And by the way, the hunger for the word of God is actually very high in the young generation. They are hungry for truth. And Proverbs 9, 10 says this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Let me explain to you what that's trying to say. If you wanna be wise, start with respecting God and who he is and get to know him. That is the beginning foundation for all knowledge and wisdom in life and understanding is know who God is. So know the word, read the Bible. Read the Bible. You will begin to fear him. You'll begin to revere and worship and respect God. And you know what? It makes sense because God is all knowing. He knows more than anyone else. So if you want to hear from God, you are already wise because he is the wisest one in the world. And so that's amazing. Proverbs 1, 7 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So don't be a fool. And let none of us be foolish. Let none of us despise the wisdom and instruction of the word of God. Amen. Amen. Psalm 19, 9 through 11. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of of, of the Lord are firm. And all of them are righteous. They are right. They are firm. They are set. They are the way to go. They are more precious than gold. To have the word of God is, is greater than gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. And by them, your servant or whoever listens to them is warned of dangers to come or anything like that. And in keeping them, there is great reward if you keep the word of God. That sounds good to me. And that's for all of us, every generation. Yesterday, I'm reading my Bible and I'm going through the Old Testament a little slower than normal. And I'm reading 2 Chronicles 26 and I see this King Uzziah 
He is 16 years old as a king. And he was the king of Judah and he reigned 52 years, the second longest king to reign. Manasseh was first. 16 year old kid. And let me tell you why I believe he had success. First, verse four says this, he did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight, just as his father Amaziah had done. Uzziah sought God during the days of Zechariah the prophet who taught him to fear God. So this young man sought after God. He was seeking God. And he also had a mentor in his life to help him. And as long as the king sought guidance from the Lord, God gave him success. Let me tell you, this, this goes to every one of us. We will be successful if we follow the ways of God. Clear and simple. Now, let me warn every listener here. Verse 16 says this, but when he had become powerful, he also became proud, which led to his downfall. His kingship ended with him being a leper. He went to the temple with pride, tried to do his own, burn his own incense. The Lord struck him with leprosy. He lived, or he, he died alone in isolation from that day forward. It matters that we finish well. That we don't depend on just one good act, but we depend on faith in God every single day till the day we die. This is why I'm calling this leaving a godly legacy. Unfortunately, yes. Can, can his kids take some things from him that's good? Yes. Can they take some things that are wrong? Yes, so be careful, right? But he could have ended and finished well, amen? And it's because he let his power and his pride get to him. So young people, I just want to encourage you to continue to fear the Lord by respecting his word and reading his word because he is all-knowing. He will lead and guide you if you continue to seek him. And this goes for all of us in this room, amen? And I've had people fall asleep in my sermons. I am glad you're here falling asleep at least. I had a gentleman come to me. I, I saw him at a restaurant after church one day. He's like, I want to apologize for falling asleep uh, during your message. I did see him falling asleep. I didn't bring it up. He brought it up. Um, and I said, he said, I was up all night farming and I just came right to church afterwards. I haven't slept yet. And I just said, hey, thank you for your transparency. Thank you for your honesty, for your confession, whatever it may be. I just thank you for helping feed us. I'll feed you spiritually. You keep feeding us physically. Yeah. But here's, here's why, you, you know, I wouldn't be mad at him anyway, but he decided to come to church instead of sleep. That's awesome. So I didn't see anything wrong. It was okay. And maybe it was a little bit of a slower message that day. Who knows? Here's some details in the little transition traveling here. Verse 13 says, Paul went by land to Assis where he had arranged for us to join him while we traveled by ship. He joined us there and we sailed together to Mytilene. And the next day we sailed past the island of Chios. The following day we crossed to the island of Samos and a day later we arrived at Miletus. Paul had decided to sail on past Ephesus for he didn't want to spend any more time in the province of Asia. He was hurrying to get to Jerusalem if possible in time for the festival of Pentecost. But when we landed at Miletus, he sent a message to the elders of the church of Ephesus asking them to come and meet him. So the, the people he was just with in the previous chapter with all the drama we talked about last week, he asked for them to come meet him halfway at least or a certain point. In verse 18 says, when they arrived, he declared, you know that from the day I set foot in the province of Asia until now, I have done the Lord's work humbly and with many tears. I have endured the trials that came to me from the plots of the Jews, and not only the Jews, but the Greeks too. I never shrank back, or the Gentiles, excuse me. I never shrank back from telling you what you needed to hear, either publicly or in your homes. There were many house churches at this time. I have had one message from Jews and Greeks alike. 
The necessity of repenting from sin and turning to God and of having faith in our Lord Jesus. In the Greek, that's structured as that happens at the same time. So we repent and we believe at the same time. You believe and therefore you repent of what you used to believe. And now you believe on Jesus Christ. And then you continue to learn and continue to be reformed and sanctified. So he's done his part. He, he's done it with tears. He's done it with faithfulness. He said, I have been faithful to you. What he's trying to do is he's trying to pass this on to the other church elders he's around. The Ephesian elders are the overseers of this, of this region in Asia. And he is guiding them by his own example. That's what we're reading here. And verse 22 says, and now I am bound by the spirit or compelled by the Holy Spirit. He is convicted to go to Jerusalem. I don't know what awaits me except that the Holy Spirit tells me in city after city that jail and suffering lie ahead. But my life, this is a beautiful verse, but my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus. The work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. In other words, my life is not worth living unless I live it to preach the gospel because God gave me that task. And it made me just reflect for a moment do I have the same conviction of why God has put me here on earth, why God has saved me, why God has sanctified me and made me holy? Am I committed to the task he has given me for his glory? And may I just encourage you to consider that as well before I even get to my application, the task that God has for you, is your life worth nothing unless you finish it? Leaving a godly legacy would be a great task, amen? every circle around you, family, friends, coworkers, you could say that one day on your deathbed, I did all I could to help other people find eternal life, amen? This is what he's done. So in a way, he's at peace. He is, he's at peace. He's content with the ministry he's done in Ephesus. It's time for him to go. By the way, this is powerful, the relationships here, but the work is greater. He's willing to multiply, he loves these people dearly, but he's willing to multiply and reach even, even more people by sending them back to do what they gotta do while he goes and does what he needs to do for the Lord. Verse 25 says, and now I know that none of you to whom I have preached the kingdom will ever see me again. I declare today that I have been faithful. If anyone suffers eternal death, it's not my fault. For I didn't shrink from declaring all that God wants you to know. Wow. Church, we could be here all day with all the things that needs to be said. There's a lot of false ideologies, a lot of false worship, a lot of false teaching in our society, in our world, all around us. We could be here till the next day of me warning you. And I have warned you on things. I will continue to warn you on things that I see. I, here's one that's just recent. Pope Francis just declared that every religion leads to God. That is false. There's the falling away. The falling away of Christians. That's not right. There is only one way to God. Through the name Jesus Christ. And I would ask that he would repent of that. Retract that statement and fix it so that people don't worship a false God and find out the truth in the end. We can't be afraid. We cannot be afraid of offending. The gospel already offends people. The word of God already does that for us. The Holy Spirit already convicts us and makes us feel bad about things we've done so that we will repent and come to him. And he's not doing it to make you feel, you know, shame and all that stuff and, and all that. He's, 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 he does that to get your attention, to get you on the right path. 
The Lord corrects us because he loves us. Paul was not afraid to say these things. And so he would say them. And he says this to the elders next. And this is so important for us. I know the majority of us are not pastors in the room, obviously. And we're not apostles or teachers, so to say, for God in, in the church. But I want to share with you what he says to other pastors. Guard yourselves and God's people. So guard yourselves and God's people. Feed and shepherd God's flock, his church, purchased with his own blood over which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as leaders. I know that false teachers like vicious wolves will come in among you after I leave, not sparing the flock. Even some men from your own group will rise up and distort the truth in order to draw a following. Watch out. Remember the three years I was with you, my constant watch and care over you night and day and many tears for you. <clears throat> my job as a pastor is to guard myself from false thinking, from unholy living and everything above and around that, all in between, so that I can lead with a clear conscience so that I can make sure I lead you in the right way. And my guide is the Bible. My guide is not my opinion. My guide is the Bible. And as long as I preach this, the only person that you might have a problem with is really God, not me. <clears throat> and my job is to feed you, to teach you the word of God. And at times to protect you, at times to correct at times, the guide and back in the right direction, to correct in the right direction, to encourage, to nurture, all those things that a shepherd would do for a sheep. And your role as the body of Christ is to submit to God and the authority he has placed. And together, as I do my part by example, not lording authority over you, but lead him humbly by example. And you do your part by submitting to authority and being here today, like right now, you are, you're practicing this. You're receiving the word of God, amen? And this is supposed to do something. This is supposed to help us grow and mature and become more like Christ. And Ephesians 4 talks about this, where the maturity helps us know what is true and what is false. So that any new wind of teaching that comes in we would be able to see it, not just the, the shepherd, but even the sheep, even the members of the church would be able to see that. So in other words, you would already know there's some false teaching being said, even sometimes in the body of Christ or outside the church. And you would be able to discern and go, oh, I know that that's not true because the word of God says this. Notice I said the word of God says this, not Pastor Ryan says this. Because the word of God says it before I ever say it. And so that's the role of that. And I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna show the scriptures for you now, but I do, I do have them, but I'm gonna just paraphrase as well. Paul tells Timothy later on in his letter, Paul, um, Timothy goes to Ephesus to be a pastor after this. And Paul tells Timothy, watch your doctrine and life closely. Be careful how you live. Be careful what you're teaching for your own salvation and the salvation of those who are listening to you. So there's a fair warning that you're sitting under proper leadership, but also that the leadership is living properly. And that is a good warning. Praise God for that too. That's, a, that's an accountability thing. And even scripture says that if a shepherd, an overseer is off, bring a witness with you to correct the shepherd. So there's accountability for me as well. And of course, I have the oversight over me to help me in the district and the network. And all this is meant to do what? To edify and strengthen the church so that we can be more effective in our community. And I believe we're on our way, amen? amen. By the grace of God, we are in that direction. So let me keep going. Verse 32 says, and now I entrust you to God and the message of his grace, 
that is able to build you up and give you inheritance with all those he has set apart for himself. I entrust you to God and the message of his grace or some translations say the word of God or the word of grace. We give them to God. I give you to God. You can pray for me and, you know, Lord, be with Pastor Ryan. I entrust him to you. Help him this week. Your kids, same thing. Lord, I give them into your hands. And may, the, may your word edify and build them up. It can go on and on. Verse 33 says, I have never coveted anyone's silver or gold or fine clothes. You know that these hands of mine have worked to supply my own needs and even the needs of those who are with me. As you can imagine, the church was a church plant. There was no funds. So Paul was a tent maker. The church still needed to be established. There still needed to be offerings being taken and things like that. And so he worked to help pay for his, his ministry. And Philippi, or the church of Philippi, was able to give him a great gift. So he spent a long time just dedicating himself to teaching. But he says something here that I need to clarify because it's an interesting note that he says. In verse 35, he says, and I have been a constant example of how you can help those in need by working hard. You should remember the words of the Lord Jesus. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Pause for a moment. That is true. But it's okay if you need to receive. There's nothing wrong with receiving. But you're in a blessed position or a blessed spot if you're able to bless others. And it is a blessing, isn't it? Isn't it? It's, it's a joyful thing to give to the church, to give to those in need. Isn't it amazing that you can have your life in order, your finances in order, that you're able to be generous to help others? But there's an interesting note here. Jesus in the gospels, that's not recorded. Never once did Jesus say that in the gospels that we have. So they believe that either this is what Jesus revealed to Paul between Acts 9 and 11, when Jesus showed up to Paul and changed his life and Jesus revealed things to Paul or this was passed down through oral tradition, through passing down through words, through testimony, but never recorded in any of the gospels. I want you to know that. I still believe that it is true and I believe it could have been passed down through oral tradition or through simply the revelation that Jesus gave Paul between Acts 9 and 11. Verse 36 through 38 says this, when he had finished speaking, he knelt and prayed with him. They all cried as they embraced and kissed him goodbye. They were sad most of all because he had said that they would never see him again. Then they escorted him down to the ship. I realize that we are not all church leaders in this room. So I sought the Lord on how do we apply this to our lives today? And that's why I entitled the message, Leaving a Godly Legacy. Can I speak to you for a moment in closing to help us pass down a legacy of God? Because this is what Paul did, not only for the church of Ephesus, but also the elders. Number one, from what I see in our scripture is that Paul knew God and he knew his task. So I would encourage you to know God and your task as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Know your task as parents. Know your task as grandparents. Know your task as a coworker or friend. Know your task as a disciple in all those things. We are meant to follow Jesus and help other people follow Jesus. This is very simple. I hope you weren't looking for an elaborate application here today. It's hard to execute though. As I follow Jesus, I am being transformed and changed and therefore those around me can be transformed and changed. As Jesus is flowing in me, Jesus overflows out of me into my kids, into my family, into my coworkers, into my church, into my community. Amen? Amen. Paul, secondly, was committed to this. Do all you can to complete your task. Know who you are. Know that you're a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ, and then be committed to it to everyone around you. This past week, 
Bless you. Allergies have been bad this week. I know from experience. This past week on the way to church, I don't know about you guys, but after a long day at work, you're tired, right? Same thing with our kids. A long day at school, you can be tired. And just like that gentleman who's a farmer, he could have stayed home and slept and he came to church. And you could also you know, apply this to everyday life. You know, I'd rather go to bed, but I'm gonna stay up and read the Bible, okay? It doesn't have to be about just coming to church. But on Wednesday night, I'm in the car and the Lord spoke a verse to me to share to my kids. 1 Timothy 4.8. And actually, I'm gonna turn to it. 1 Timothy 4.8. Physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better. Promising benefits in this life and the life to come. My kids got educational training. Uh, my son's a soccer player. My daughter is a volleyball player. They know how to train on a field. She knows how to train on a court. Training doesn't stop there though. There's spiritual training that will last forever. And so you know it, we get in the car and we go to church or we go to our training. And I wanna encourage you to look at even today as spiritual training. Or when you go to a small group or a Bible study, it's spiritual training. Or when you bring up a verse like that in the car on the way to church, it's spiritual training. I was making sure my kids know that God is number one and that their spiritual training is of greatest importance than anything else in the world. Yes, physical training is good for you. Spiritual training lasts forever though. Simple discipleship, yes. Praise the Lord. That is a simple way to disciple your kids as a parent. And be committed to your task. Paul was committed. Nothing swayed him. Look how many times we've read in the book of Acts where he was dealing with opposition. It's getting exhausting. Even in the beginning of our scripture, they were doing that to him. And he stayed faithful. Do you know how exhausted he must have been? In fact, he talks in other books of the Bible, like Corinthians, the burden it was to carry all the churches on his heart. How many times he was flogged and beaten. How many bad things happened to him, but he continued to be faithful. Parents, I know what you're going through too. Grandparents, I see what you're going through too. Those who don't have kids and you're, you're continuing to be faithful to the Lord in the midst of all the trials you have, I just want you to know that God is gonna use that to continue to make disciples around you. What I'm really saying is too, he is your strength after a long, hard day to once again pull from the well of Christ in your heart, draw that life out and give it away again. You know exactly what I'm talking about. When you just want to rest, I just want to encourage you to keep going. And listen, this, I'm going to say this, this is so important. I draw from my personal time with God. You must have a relationship with Christ so that you have something to give. Amen. When it comes to leaving a legacy, a godly legacy, two more points, really simple. Entrust your efforts and loved ones into the will of God. That's what Paul did. He did what he needed to do. He entrusted them into God and God's word. Do your part. Do your part and have faith in God to finish the work. Now, do we finish the work? Absolutely. We do everything we can to the last day. You can say that you've done everything you can. I want to speak to those, though, who feel like they've messed up. Because that is a real thing. I just want to let you know, God knows how to fix those failures from your past life. God knows how to redeem things that were broken and fix those things. God knows how to repair those relationships and those situations. I will say this, one way to start is by being humble and admitting you weren't perfect as a parent, as a grandparent, as a child. Let me speak to children real quick. Children, 
Honor and obey your parents. Honor and obey your parents so that one day you won't live with regret how you could have treated your parents better. Start now. Start now. Learning how to be a godly person, to leave a godly legacy. You don't have to wait till you're older. And lastly, be at peace because you gave your life to leave a godly legacy. That entire portion of scripture where he's talking to the Ephesian elders, he was at peace. He was able to leave them after a long journey together because he had done all he could. I just wanna encourage you that do all you can and be at peace that God's gonna take care of the rest, amen? If you can, let's stand together as we close. Hey, thanks for not falling asleep. I didn't say this, but uh, Paul fell on him and, and, and held him like Elijah and Elisha did in the Old Testament. And they came back to life. And Paul held him and he came back to life. He prayed for him. So we would do the same thing just in case it happened here, but it didn't happen. But... Thank you for making God a priority. Whether you're watching online right now, sitting through the whole thing or, or being here, thank you for having a hunger for God's word. As grandparents and parents, you're already leading the way. Way to go. Remain strong in passing down Jesus throughout the week. Let it come out naturally. Let the Lord lead you. I, I, this is what I prayed the first service. I'm gonna pray the same thing. When Paul said the spirit of God was compelling him to go to Jerusalem, I ask that the spirit of God will compel you and help you to know what to do next in leaving the legacy. Let's pray that. Lord, I thank you so much for speaking to us today. And Lord, your word is all we need to be disciples of Christ. We thank you for Jesus saving us and showing us how to live. I pray God that we won't complicate it that God, you would help us to follow Jesus and to let Jesus come out of our lives, that we'll talk about him, we'll love like him, we'll live like him. Lord, I pray that your spirit would lead us on the next steps. Lord, you see the different dynamics in the families, the coworkers, the friends. Lord, we want to pass on the most important person in the world we all know is Jesus. He is the answer for salvation and eternal life. And God, I pray, Lord, that you would lead us by your spirit on how to handle our next steps moving forward. For those of us who may need to humble ourselves and, and apologize that we didn't do everything right and we need to start over. Maybe it's the, the young generation that needs to say, I haven't been listening to you or I haven't been taking your advice and I'm sorry. Lord, whatever it may be, God, I just pray you lead and guide. We thank you, Lord, for this church and how we're here today because people before us left a legacy. So Lord, we do the same thing. Not just in our engagement through attendance or giving or serving, but even inviting people to come to church, even in evangelizing outside this community. We are making a difference. We are a light in this dark world. And God, many of us have come here through relationship, through evangelism, through love. And I thank you for that, God. And Lord, I pray you continue to use us to be a light. The legacy of Calvary would be, we pray, that Jesus was first and foremost here worshiped. And that Jesus was honored and Jesus was lived out by its members. So I pray, God, that we would go and live like Christ in our community, in our homes, and wherever we go. Lord, let there be a beautiful legacy and continue to build it, Lord, for your name and your glory, not ours. It's all for your glory. And we will continue to seek you and follow you. So Lord, you, in your favor, would give us success. We thank you, Lord, for all this, and we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.